very much appreciate having the opportunity of talking about twister theory. But when I look at the size of the audience, I'm slightly worried. Uh, the talk will be more technical than yesterday's talk, and there will be equations, more than two. Uh, no, the idea of twister theory is actually quite ancient now. I forget how, about half a century old, if no more than that. Uh, in fact, if you go back into history, you'll find that there were uh, ideas that are used in twister theory that go back two centuries, not just one. But I won't talk about that. What is the idea here? The idea is to have a description of space-time which is more in accordance with the ideas of quantum mechanics. So it's not trying to quantize gravity. You see, most people, when they think of bringing gravitational theory, that space-time structure, into union with quantum mechanics, they think of what's called quantizing. So they think of taking Einstein's theory of space-time, general relativity, and applying the procedures of quantum mechanics to it. Now, I have to think that's not correct. I think my voice has disappeared. Is that right? I happen to think that is not the correct point of view, that we need something which is more of even-handed marriage between these two subjects with give on both sides. Now, initially, twister theory is just a way of looking at space-time. And it's just a way of looking at the older idea of space-time, which describes special, the special theory of relativity. And it uses four dimensions. People think of four dimensions as due to Einstein. It's really Minkowski's <coughs> picture of geometrizing the view that Einstein had of the kind of relativity that the speed of light was the same whichever way you go, and so on. But it did not have a curved space-time which describes gravity. It's space-time which is flat, and Einstein didn't understand it that way, but Minkowski showed to Einstein, look, it's geometry in four dimensions. Einstein was not too happy at first, but then he <coughs> took on the view, and he improved upon it with his general theory where the space-time ceases to be flat. But for the moment, I'm just talking about flat space-time. When we get to curved space-time, that's really the talk I will give tomorrow. But uh, there are a lot of interesting things happen that happen in the theory of flat space-time. Now here is, of course, I can't show you all four dimensions, but you have to imagine that this four-dimensional space-time of Minkowski, and this is a light ray. This is the point, and the idea that we normally have a space is that in some sense it's built up of points. Now these points, I should say, are not the points we think of in ordinary Euclidean idea, because time is also uh, a parameter that you need to know <laughs> to determine the point. So it's an event. It's a moment of time as well as position of space. So when I have a point here, I mean ev an event in space time. Now what is this? This is a light ray. So if you have photon, think of that as a particle traveling with the speed of light in a straight line, that's what it is here. So it's the history, the entire history of that photon. And the, the initial idea of twister theory is turn this picture around. So that we have a new space, I'm calling it PN. It may seem a little strange to have a notation like this, but it's part of the general framework. Minkowski space is M, and I'm using this funny kind of letter, which is useful. Um, then M after Minkowski. And PN, well, N is after null, which this is what's called a null line. It's of a, a, a path of the history of the light ray. And this now is represented by a single point. And the point here is represented by the family of all light rays through a given point in this space. So Minkowski space time, you take a point here, you look at all the light rays through that point, that will describe a sphere. It's really the celestial sphere, if you like. You look out at the sky, you imagine you're out in space, you look out the sky, and you see points all the way around, each one corresponding to a direction that a light ray might be coming to you from. So that is a sphere, an ordinary two-dimensional sphere, which represents the point. So the point here becomes a sphere, 
the line here, the light ray, becomes a point. Okay, so that's the initial idea of Twister theory. You might ask why, and another point you might ask, is that any old sphere? Well, that's an interesting thing. The, this is where relativity and quantum mechanics begin to come together. And first of all, I'm thinking of that point, it's the uh, left-hand part of that picture there, and you're looking out now at the universe, imagine yourself out in space, say, you're looking out at the universe, and all the different light rays coming into your eye are drawn, well, some of them are drawn here, and that might be a star, and you're seeing it, and that's the light from that star, this might be another star, this might be another star, another star, and all those will look like different points on your celestial sphere. Now, a characteristic property of the celestial sphere, which is crucial to the picture here, is it's a conformal sphere. Now, what does that mean? It means that angles are the same for different observers. You see, you might imagine there's one observer here looking out at the sky, another one looking out at the same sky, but traveling with a great speed, and they just pass each other, and at that moment, they both look out at the sky. The, sc the pattern they see is a little bit different through a phenomenon known as aberration. The, the direction you're moving in will slightly spread out, the direction you're moving away from will be slightly squashed in. Of course, you have to travel at a speed which is close to the speed of light to see any significant effect. Although people have observed this from a long time ago through the Earth's motion around the sky. It's an effect called aberration. But here I have four stars. And let's suppose that those four stars to one observer look as though they lie on a circle in the sky. Now, the property that happens here, if there was another observer looking at the same sky, that will also look like a circle. That's not immediately obvious, but it happens to be the case for the particular transformation which one observer sky will be when you, you take it to the other observer sky. Circles go to circles. But more critically, it's that angles on one sphere go to the same angle on the other sphere, and this is what's called conformal. Now, there's another way of looking at a conformal sphere, and that is to say that it's a complex sphere. Now, this, you need to have the idea of a complex number. You see, if you have, with ordinary real numbers we're used to, you can imagine a one-dimensional thing which might be a loop like this. But if you are thinking of complex numbers, there are two dimensions to the numbers, and therefore, the simplest thing would be a sphere. And this is what's called a Riemann sphere. And this Riemann sphere has this property that circles go to circles, angles go to angles, and this is a special feature that you get in relativity. If this was a Newtonian picture, this would not be true. It, it characterizes, if you like, what's called the Lorentz group, which is the symmetries of transformations keeping a point fixed in special relativity. Okay, so that is one, that's coming from relativity. You have an interpretation of the sphere that we have over here as one-dimensional surface. Now, what is the other area? That's quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics, you also have the Riemann sphere playing a very important role. And here, I'm going to think of it a little differently. This is now a particle of spin half, as it's called, like an electron. And that electron has a spin. It always got the same amount of spin, but you might imagine its spin axis could point in all sorts of directions. The quantum mechanics is a bit funny this way. You have to think of the different directions that the quantum mechanical spin axis could be are really built up of just two directions. And people tend to say spin up and spin down, but all the other directions come about from the principles of quantum mechanics, one of the most basic principles being the superposition principle. So if you have spin up, that means that the axis is upwards and the spin is right-handed about that. Spin down means that it's left-handed about up or right-handed about down. And these form a basis of all the states. And a general state will be a superposition, a quantum mechanical superposition of those two. And that will be some other direction. So these are all the directions it could spin in are superpositions of any two. And the way that these superpositions work, these numbers here which give you the relative 
contribution of each of these two. These have to be complex numbers, and it's the ratio of these two complex numbers which gives you the Riemann sphere. Now, I know that physicists will know all about this thing, but a lot of you, uh, it may not be familiar to you. But it is a very important part of how quantum mechanics, if you like, looks at things which are very small. So you could say a particle, uh, it could be an electron, it could be a proton, it could even be a quark, one of the components of a, of a proton. As long as it's one of these things which spins with the smallest non-zero amount it can spin with, it will be like this. So we have the Riemann sphere playing these two roles, one from relativity and one from quantum mechanics. And this sort of apparent coincidence, if you like, of these two uh, roles for the Riemann sphere, but it, they uh, are important to these two areas, uh, general relativity and quantum mechanics. Okay, now I want to go a little further here and show you in detail how this works. And here I am now going to, well at the top you see we have, we've, here we have the correspondence that I was just describing to you. But now I'm putting down coordinates. Space-time will have four coordinates. The speed of light is taken to be one. This is what the convention that one does. You might say, uh, this is speed of light very big. And not one, is it? Well, it's no, nowadays it really is one. Because you might say, a second is a good measure of time. And what is a good measure of distance? Well, a meter isn't a very good measure of distance, even though there's the meter rule in Paris. Uh, we now think that a light second is a much better definition of a second, of, of a distance. So the light second is your basic measure of distance, and the second is your ba basic measure of time, then the speed of light is one. So it's just a question of your units. Okay, now here we have the basic formula, which I shall call the incidence relationship, which relates these two pictures. And this incidence relation, well, you need to know about matrices uh, to know formula. It looks a little out of focus. Is this something I can improve here? There we are. Well, I'm assuming you know about matrices here. I, I shall assume more things as I go on. Um, if this equation holds, that is the relationship between the z's here, z0, 1, 2, and 3, which are the coordinates over here, are related to the, these are the purple ones, are related to the orange ones, which are the four coordinates here in Minkowski space. That's the x, y, z, and t, t being the time. So the incidence relation is that equation. And that equation on one side tells you that the line described by the z's passes through the points described by the x, y, and t, z, and t, the orange ones. And over here, it says that the point described by the z lies on the line. Well, the lower left there line, it's the Riemann sphere over here. So it's the incidence over here, the incidence over here. And that defines the correspondence between the two. So this is the fundamental equation describing incidence. And it gives its correspondence. Now there's an equation that these z's have to satisfy in order for you to be able to find real numbers here to satisfy that equation. And this equation here is important. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, I think this is the right picture here. Now I shall put something else in here. You see, suppose we didn't have that equation at the bottom, then the z's, those are the twister components, and so let me put it over on the other side, although I don't have the whole picture there. Um, these coordinates that I use z for, these are the twister coordinates. The ratios of them, they're all complex numbers, so the ratios of them are coordinates for what are called complex projective space. So this space here, the coordinates for that space are defined by the ratios of the z's. And so since the z's have four complex numbers, their ratios are three independent numbers, and therefore this is a three complex dimensional space. But the points which satisfy that equation at the bottom, I mean the twister points, which satisfy that equation on the bottom, are a subspace. That's the pn I talked about before. So the whole twister space is this complex space, and we have this PN. Now you see, the sort of motivation behind this is that 
I haven't mentioned this yet, but one of my big motivations in trying to understand the way that nature works in the small came from my fascination when I was a graduate student uh, in London University, at University College, with complex numbers. And not just complex numbers, but what's called complex analysis, the way that functions of these complex numbers behave, and it is an absolutely fascinating subject. Not just a fascinating, it's magic. And I think it was the magic in that subject was something which held my attention. I thought, my gosh, is it maybe the world works according to that magic? And I think that feeling I had extended into my research work later on in life to a huge degree. And I still believe that, that somehow we have to see how that the world, the physics of the world, is really in disguise the physics or mathematics of these complex numbers. When I say complex number, for those of you who are not familiar with this notion, I mean, well, a real number is thing you might have an infinite decimal, plus or minus at the beginning, and a complex number, you have to bring in a square root of minus one. So you, you think, well, minus one has no square roots because negative things square to positive things and positive things square to positive things, so how do you get negative things? Well, you invent, if you like, another entity. Well, I think invent is the wrong word because it is so magical that it really is something which is God-given in a sense. And this idea is, is something which, as I say, fascinated me from an early stage in, in my mathematical life and I felt, wouldn't it be wonderful if in some sense the world operates according to these magic numbers? And that is the real driving force behind what I'm saying here. And so the point of thinking about twister theory was that, okay, we have here a real space with real numbers, the x, y, z, and t, but in some sense here we've translated it into a, uh, a mathematics of complex numbers, because the z's that I have are complex. It's not quite, you see, the first thing which makes this appealing is that you have, um, I guess in that picture on the left, no, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's the picture here, but I can't bring them back together very easily. Um, you see, the equation at the bottom is needed in order for this correspondence to work. Suppose we didn't have that equation at the bottom, then you would really have a complex space over here, and that complex space will have these complex subspaces, which are these Riemann spheres. And that was a complex geometry done with complex numbers to describe the real space-time that we know. It doesn't quite work for a very basic reason, and this very basic reason is that any complex space interpreted in real terms has to have an even number of dimensions. Why even? Well, because each complex number contains two real numbers. Every complex number z is a real number plus i times, i is the square root of minus one, times another real number. So the two real numbers make a complex number. So that whenever you have a complex space, each complex number will give you two dimensions. Each complex dimension will give you two real dimensions. So I was talking about the Riemann sphere, it's two-dimensional, but in complex terms, it's a curve. You have to get used to that idea. So here we have a space, a space which is a complex space of three dimensions, which means in real terms, it's going to be six dimensions. And then you say, well, what about light rays? How many are there? How many dimensions worth? It's easy to count them, and you see it's five. So we're one short. And the five is represented by this space Pn, which means, well, P means projective, as you want to word this. T means twister space. And the T here as, are those ones for which the quadratic form at the bottom here is positive, and the plus ones are those for which this is negative. If it's zero, then there's the null one. So we have now a space which is complex, but it's got this big thing in the middle of it. The whole thing is six real dimensions, but the thing in the middle has five real dimensions. Okay, so that's the picture, but I'll let me make it a little bit more complete by saying, okay, that was a projective space. That means that I'm only looking at the ratios of the z's. 
I'm only interested in the z's up to a factor. So, you see, if I take any of my z's here, and I multiply all of them by the same complex number, it doesn't do anything. It's the same point in the projective space. But it's a different twister. So this picture now is giving the twisters. The twister itself, which the z's are the coordinates of, will be some point in this green thing here. The projective one is then the point that I have marked here in purple. So the, the non-projective space, as we want to say, the non-projective twister space is four dimensions, four complex dimensions, so eight real dimensions, but it's a vector space, so you can add things, and it's, algebraically it's much nicer. So the, the, a vector space is much nicer algebraically than a projective space, if you like, whereas geometrically the projective space is easier to understand. So that's why I'm giving you this picture, because sometimes we need the scale factor, sometimes we don't. If you don't want it, then the picture I had before is fine. If you do want the scale factor, then we want this green thing here, which is really twisted space. Now you notice that you may have been caught, this may have caught your eye here, but I've got these wiggly things over here now. What are they? Well those, you see, it's, it's a bit of magic here, because I started with just light rays. And light rays gave us this subspace. And I just postulated this other bit here. But now I'm going to tell you that the points up here mean something physically. They mean photons which have spin. So you'll see, these have got a little twist, twisty line along them. You see, photon states can be thought of as right-handed and left-handed. Maybe I'll put this on the other side to give you a feeling for them. Here are the left-handed and the right-handed photons. They spin right or left. And this has to do with circular polarization, right-handed or left-handed. And the right-handed ones actually do represent points up here. So whereas I started by saying, OK, this is just a mathematical fiction. I had these nice z's. Why don't we allow them not to satisfy the equation I had at the bottom there? And then that's just a piece of mathematics. But now we suddenly see, no, they actually represent physical things. They represent photons with their momentum, which means they have a frequency now, and they also have a helicity, right-handed or left-handed. And, well, there's a nice piece of geometry, I'm not going to talk about it particularly, that you see if you have, like the picture I had before of the relationship of the Riemann sphere and the spin, the spin half particle, you also get a relationship by the Riemann sphere and these coefficients. You see every state of polarization of a photon is a linear combination, quantum mechanical combination, of right-handed and left-handed, and then you get things like elliptical polarization, plane <laughs> polarization. In fact, things, if you go to the three-dimensional 3D movie, you have these glasses, and I, it took me a long time to figure out exactly how the polarization of polarized glasses works, so I don't know how it works, but what it's doing, because it actually looks, distinguishes between the right-handed and left-handed polarization, but what gets into your eye is the polarization which is a linear polarization. Let me not go into that because it's irrelevant to my talk here, but I just get distracted by myself sometimes. Um, the polarizations represent right and left of the north and south pole in this picture, and then the general polarizations give you some elliptical shape. Don't bother about that because it's not too relevant for my talk, although interesting. Now, that then tells us that we can, if we go to the full twister in this big picture here, you can actually describe the Helicity, the left-handed and the right-handedness, and also the frequency, and this gives you a real inter physical interpretation of not just this subspace, but the whole plane, the whole space. And so it really is physics I'm talking about, not just a bit of mathematical uh, fluff, if you like. Now, those of you who are in the know mathematically will can, I can explain twister theory very quickly too. If you know what the co Klein correspondence is. It's twister theory, except Klein had it for a long time, before 1870. And I think, uh, I think uh, Sophus Lee had it even before that, as far as I remember. Anyway, let's not bother about the history of things. Uh, what we have is a point in twister space now, and this, I'm not even bothering about the bit in the middle, so it's a purely complex thing now. A point corresponds to something in this what's called a four-quadric in projective space. So I'm being a bit technical, so 
Um, I'm afraid it will get more technical as I as go on. Uh, if you take a, this will be a four quadric. In other words, it's a four complex dimensional space, which sits in a five complex dimensional projective space. Now you see, this is like your space time, but complexified, so I put a C there. That means you take your coordinates, which I had before, and where they were, you know, x, y, z, and t, when they were real numbers before, I now make them complex numbers. So the space-time has become complex. And you can understand your twisters in terms of these things that Klein knew all about, the alpha planes and the beta planes. I'm not going to tell you what they are here. If you know about these things, that's fine. And the alpha planes correspond to the points in twisted space and the beta ones the planes in twisted space. And then the incidence is just points on planes, planes on points, planes e intersecting each other and all that. Those of you who are interested, you could stare at that picture at the bottom. I want to use this picture for something else, which I'll come to later, but let me just do it here. You see, there's something else which I've idealized from our ordinary picture of space-time. I've made it complex over here now. But the other thing I've idealized is I've introduced points at infinity. You see, normally you think of a light ray or something as something finite, but you could imagine that thing being out at infinity. And if you allow yourself these infinite, infinite elements, then you get this. And if they're also complex, then you get this Klein quadric, as it's known. Now, if you, I just have a picture here. I think I'll come back to this perhaps later on, but. I just want to make the picture a bit more complete. You see, there is a plane here which intersects this thing in what looks like two lines, but if you need all the dimensions, the two lines are really a cone. So you have out the infinity a cone, and that cone is really joined up on itself. So if you really want to know the full picture, it's that. But uh, it's the intersection with a plane it gives you these elements of infinity. And this is defined by a particular twister, again, which I'll come back to, which has two indices, it's skew symmetrical. Let me not worry too much about that here. Uh, I should say one point though, and that is, and I mentioned this in my talk yesterday, there is this thing called the cosmological constant, which we now believe is there, and if you have a cosmological constant, it slightly changes this picture. You have something uh, which is non-zero, which would have been zero in the other case, this I thing, there's a contraction with itself which is zero, and it's non-zero in the more general case when there's a cosmological constant, and the cosmological constant actually, uh, I don't see, if, I haven't written it down here, but it comes in there. It is really, is this number here. Don't worry about it. But I'll just show you that in that case, infinity looks a bit different, and I've drawn it there. I, I think it's probably not something I should spend too much time on here at the moment, what I do want to do is to go on to something else. You see, geometrically, in fact, why have I called these things twisters? There's nothing I've said to you here very strongly got a twist to it. Well, look at the photons are spinning around about their axis. So they've got a twist to them in a sense. But that, I didn't know about this at the time. When I gave the name twisters to these objects, I had something quite different in mind. And I want to show you what that is. It's a way, if you like, of understanding these mysterious points which lie outside the surface Pn. So going back to my early picture, where I had, ooh, wherever I put it, um, I want the other one that it sticks on to, here we go. You see here we had the light ray space, which is the space Pn, and then we had the other space and I said, OK, you can interpret these things as photons. That's the physical interpretation. But I didn't know that when I started thinking about this. What started me thinking about this extended space was something completely different. It was something, you see, what I felt I wanted, for reasons which I may be able to indicate to you later, I wanted something where you had a space which was divided into two halves by something else. Now. I don't know how much time I'm allowed here, but if I get to that point, I will explain why I was interested in that. It has something to do with quantum field theory, and quantum field theory, uh, one of the crucial features in it is you want to be able to say what you mean by 
positive energy and negative energy, and when you translate that into mathematics, it is positive frequency and negative frequency, and the way people do this is to do a complicated thing known as Fourier analysis, and the Fourier analysis enables you to pick out the positive from the negative frequencies. Now, I didn't like that very much because I was hoping something which could extend from flat space, where the Fourier analysis is clear what it means, to something where you had a purely geometrical way of seeing what the distinction between positive and negative frequency was. And this comes to understanding the Riemann sphere and cutting it into two halves, and the positive frequency is one way and the negative frequency is down the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. I think it's actually the negative frequency is the northern hemisphere, but never mind about that. And I wanted something which works in, in the full number of space-time dimensions. So I was searching for something where the real things that you directly picture are on some kind of boundary which cuts a space in two. Now, I had no idea what I was looking for, but I had this picture of something I learned from Ivor Robinson. He was looking at solutions of Maxwell's equations, and he had a way of constructing certain solutions which had a kind of twist to them. You see, you can think of a light ray, and he was looking at things called congruences of rays. I'll say a little bit more about that. But you imagine a light ray, and you look at all the other light rays which meet it. And this thing called a congruence of light rays, is, this is an example of one. It's a system of, of lines, light, light rays, which meet a given light ray. And then he had this ingenious idea, you push this light ray into the complex space, and the lines which meet it are still there, even though the thing that they meet is now complex. And this is an interesting congruence of lines, which I refer to as a Robinson congruence, because he first thought of that structure. And I was interested in these Robinson congruences, and I realized they could twist one way, they could twist the other way, and I was being driven back, I think, from San Antonio, somewhere in Texas, and I had a peaceful time thinking about mathematics in the car, because the driver was somebody who likes to be silent, and I like to be silent too sometimes, and I thought about these Ivor Robinson congruences. And they twist one way, or they twist the other way. And I re had a realization, I know what they are. Well, let me, first of all, give you the picture here. Here is now the twist of space divided into two halves, and that was the thing I wanted, you see. I didn't know this yet, you see, but that's the twist of space divided into two halves. And how do you think about a point which is not on here? If it's on here, it's a light ray. But suppose it's up here. Well, one thing you can do is you can do what's forming the complex conjugate. You see, sit the bar over it, and this complex conjugate, I goes to minus i, and then the interpretation of that is a plane, a complex plane. So it's a four real dimensional space. The plane is two dimensions, but the complex is four dimensions. And this thing determines and is determined by that conjugate, if you like, or complex conjugate plane. And if you want to know what that point is, representing that geometrically, you look for the intersection of this plane with the things you know, and that's your congruence. And that is the Robinson congruence, a whole lot of lines like this, in space-time. And then I have the thought, what is that? I know what it is. It's this. Now what's that? Well, you see, all these lines, which over here, meet the, um, yeah. Well, it's supposed to meet the line which is, uh, which is invisible, because it's up here. But suppose it was down here, you see, then this plane would actually go through it, and then all these lines meeting it, you'd have a congruence which is lines meeting a light ray. But if you move that into the complex part here, these things twist around each other, and at any one moment, you see, you look out, you've got a whole lot of light rays moving all over. Every point in space, in flat space, is moving at the speed of light somewhere. This way, this way, that way, that way. And how do we know what that configuration looks like? It looks like this. Now, what is this? Those, the experts will know, but this is a stereographic projection of Clifford parallels, or what, as people more commonly know it now, is the Hopf vibration, 
of a three manifold. So you have a three sphere, and you take that three sphere, and at each point it's got a, a little line, a little direction on it. You project it down. Stereographic means you take a point on that sphere, and you project down from that point onto a, a plane which is um, parallel to the tangent at that point. And at every point in space then, in this projection, I will get a point here. Now you have to imagine that that's a little photon which is zipping along with the speed of light, so it will, but at any one moment, you see, it has a place. Wherever it is, you wonder which way is it going, which way is it going, you look at the line here through it, see these are, the Clifford parallels are a family of circles which, family, which fill the whole of the three sphere and project it down, they fill up the whole of three space. Um, you've got a straight line as a particular example, that's the one that goes through infinity, and all the rest are circles. So you have these circles interlocking, every pair of them interlock, and they form this wonderful twisting configuration, which is referred to as Clifford parallels, and it's the Hopf's map, as those people here who know about these things will know. Um, and as I say, each point there will be a circle going through that point, and that will have a direction, and you want to see which way is it going. It goes that way with the speed of light, and you want to say, what's it look like the next minute? Well, if it looked like that one minute, well, I shouldn't say minute, one tiny little fraction of a second, it'll look like that in the next tiny fraction of a second. The configuration remains completely constant. The whole thing moves with the speed of light in some direction, and that describes the Robinson congruence. Now, this to me is something which could well be important in the discussions that, that we've been having. Um, with um, uh, Ernesto, we were talking, I think two days ago, was it? No. Um, and, and you were telling me that the thing that I want to talk about tomorrow, which has to do with uh, things called non commutative geometry. Don't worry, I'm not going to talk about non commutative geometry today. But the example that Ernesto gave me was exactly using this configuration. And not just this. You see, this configuration describes geometrically a point up here or down here. It twists one way if it's up here and the other way if it's down here. And um, if it's on the, the surface in the middle, that is where this thing shrinks. The, there's a sort of circle around the middle here, which shrinks to a point, and that zips along with the speed of light. But if it's up or down, it twists one way or the other, and this whole configuration zips along with the speed of light. I thought, my gosh, that's what I'm looking for. You have a space divided into two halves, and it somehow uh, encodes the information of, well, uh, the kind of information that you want for quantum field theory. And uh, it took a long time for these things to, to realize themselves in, in actual fact, but, but that was the initial motivation. Here I have another picture. This was from my book, book The World of Reality. I don't think this is a good picture. I wanted to new, draw a new one, but it zips along with the speed of light. It's the same as that picture there, but that one's more elaborate, and uh, I'll leave that one up there. Something else about it is that if you want the twister itself, not just it up to proportionality. That's you don't just want the projective twister, you want the actual twister, the z, not just the z up to proportionality. Then it has a phase. Now that phase is a complex number, which is a, of unit modulus. It's a, little, it's a member of a, a circle, a circle in the complex plane. And the geometrical interpretation of that is a little flag plane. This is now going back to the spin half things I was talking about before. And I say you superpose up, spin up, and spin down, and you just get spin in some other direction. But if you go a little further, and in quantum mechanics, you don't just have these directions, you actually have a phase. You have a complex number which has unit modulus, that is to say it's a distance one from the origin, from the zero in the complex plane. And that thing um, is a freedom that you have in the whole twister, in the whole spinner. Now, you see, this spinner, according to Mr. Spinner, it describes the spin of an electron, but you can also think of it as a, you know, in terms of a light ray. This is the Riemann sphere, that's this 
the earth or the sky, if you like. Now, if I introduce the phase of that thing, that's a little flag plane. So you not just have a direction along the light cone, which is a point in the sky, but you have a little arrow sitting out there, pointing, if you like, at another star in the sky. It's an infinitesimal arrow, it's just a direction. And if, as your phase goes around uh, the unit circle, this arrow actually goes around twice. It's a curious thing about spinners, but never mind. Where it points is another circle. That's the circle of possible directions here. That's the flag plane. This is what we call a spinner. The spinner has these two components, W and Z. It is not just a direction on the sphere, it's also got a, size, a scale for the magnitude and also has this phase. So that means, when you go and look at this picture over here, that there are, is another little circle in this picture here. So it's got a phase to it as well, and this is even closer to what Ernesto was talking to me about. And I thought that he might be rather fascinated because this is the kind of thing quite off the bat he was telling me about, and this is supposed to relate to what I say tomorrow, and I can see, gosh, it looks as though it's promising, and for some reason I've forgotten about this picture. It's not just something like it, it is it, which is extraordinary. So we'll see where that goes, I hope. Uh, that's a little bit of a, a detour from what I want to say. I really have no idea what the time is or how long I should speak for. Uh, let me just drone on for a bit, I think. Um, you see, what is a twister? Well, you see, once you know what a spinner is, it tells you more what a twister is, and you represent it, your spinner, your twister Z, is really two spinners. So I gave you what a spinner was and the picture of it, uh, which was this one I just gave you here. The two spinners. This is, this is, I have 20 minutes. I have, I have 20 minutes more. Good. I think I should be able to give you a rough picture of what twister theory is doing, at least before we get to curved space-time, which is what I hope to do. Now here is a spinner. The complete picture of a spinner is this little light ray here, pointing a certain distance into the future, so it's got a momentum to it, and it's got this flag plane, which is a direction on the sphere. It's got a two-valued ambiguity to it, which has to do with if you rotate this thing once, it's gone to minus itself. If you rotate it again, it gets back to itself. That's a, a little feature that you have to bear in mind. But let me be a little bit more specific about the notation. You see, here's where people start to boggle a lot with twist, twister theory because they often don't know the two-spinner notation very well. You may know about tensor notations where you have indices like this. This is a four-dimensional index. And with the spinners, you split it into two two-dimensional indices. And you just, you know, I'm not going to explain all these equations. I think that it's worth having the picture here. Here's the same picture I had before with a little null flag, uh, which is, gives you, up to a sign, gives you a very precise description of a spinner. Now, if you want a twister, then you need two of these things. And those are the things I'm called omega and pi. And now if this is a null twister, in other words, if it really does describe a light ray and it isn't pushed over to the top or the bottom, then you can very nicely see what this omega and pi do. Here we have the twister going along. It's got a momentum which is given by pi. The momentum is pi times its complex conjugate. And it's got a sort of moment about the origin, and that's this other thing called omega. And the pi and the omega together give you a twister. So you can get a good feeling just from, once you got used to a spinner a bit like that, then you can think of a twister. The omega it points from the origin to the light ray here. So if the light ray is over here, and you want to know what omega is, well, up to proportionality, you say, you see where this intersects the light cone here, and that gives you the direction of omega. So it's very geometrical. Now I'm going, to more, I'm going to throw a lot of equations at you, so you can go to sleep if you don't like equations, but uh, if you want to know more about what's going on, here is the incident relation I had before. This is the two-spinner way of writing it, the, two, the spinner, and it's now got an index, which I find very handy. This is the mo moment part, and this is the moment, momentum part, moment about the origin, and here is the incident relation with that indices, and this is what happens when you shift the origin. And this is the ZZ bar, which was the equation I had written at the bottom to tell you when you had a null twister. Those were the ones that are geometrically representing light rays. Light rays. That's when this ZZ bar is zero. That's the twister way of writing down that equation I had at the bottom 
um, early on, and let's not even bother to find it because I don't want to go into too much detail. This is the explicit set of equations which tell you how to relate the twister, in other words, the omega and the pi, to the things that physicists are more used to. Okay, you've got a momentum for this massless particle, which has got spin to it. That massless particle has a momentum p, and this p, as I said before, without the indices, is just the pi times itself. And it automatically points into the future, and does what you want. The angular momentum, those of you who know about relativity, angular momentum in relativity, is a quantity with two indices, which is skew symmetrical. It's a, a form, but it's really a, never mind about that. It's got six components, which is the angular momentum. And it's got a spin, which is this thing called uh, the pauli lubanski vector. And this thing is obtained by sticking these things together. Now, as a self-respecting particle in ordinary physics has a characteristic feature that its momentum and its pauli lubanski spin vector are proportional to one another. And the factor of proportionality is this thing called the helicity. The helicity can be positive, negative, or zero. If it's zero, that's the good old light rays we had. If it's positive, it's spinning right-handed. That's the right-handed spinning things. If it's negative, it's spinning left-handed. And this now is a formula, the round brackets mean skew symmetry, the epsilon means symmetry, sorry. The epsilon means a skew symmetric object. Let's not bother with the details, but there are formulae, that's really what I want to say, there are formulae which directly go from the omega and the pi to the momentum and angular momentum that relativistic physicists know about. Okay, so that is standard stuff. I don't know whether I should even show you this, but let's do it, because I have a slide. You can see all this in this picture, too. You, 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 at any point, there will be a... What the, if you choose the origin at that point, you tell you what the omega and the pi are. So you can follow it all around, and, and this picture, in a sense, also represents the way that the angular momentum of a massless particle with spin behaves. I mean, it's, it's not very much recognized by physicists, but a spinning massless particle really has this configuration to describe it. And it, it's there. And the omega and pi are just uh, related to the twisted descriptions I had before. But I don't think I need to worry with that too much here. Or well, I can leave that there if you want me to. Uh, OK. Now, that is classical twister theory, how the classical twister relates to a well-known concept in physics, the angular momentum and momentum of a particle without mass. So it's a classical photon. And you, if you want to talk about a quantum mechanical photon, then you have to have some kind of quantization procedure. And this leads you to things, this leads you to things which don't commute with each other, or a characteristic feature of quantum mechanics is you have operators where A times B is not the same as B times A. And you find that in twister theory, there's a very, very natural quantization. This is to say that your twister, its complex conjugate, is its canonical conjugate. A canonical conjugate, well, like, to give you an example, position and momentum are canonical conjugates. These are the things which Heisenberg tells you you can't measure at once, and so on. And these things have this property that they don't, if you multiply one, one way, they have a, it's different from multiplying the other way, and the difference has a very simple form. And this is what you're saying, exactly what happens with the twisters. They're not, they're more complicated mixture of, of angular momentum and momentum and position and so on, but they're encoded in this twister and of a remarkably neat way, which allows these commutation rules to have this re remarkably neat form. So the twisters commute with the twisters, that means Z, a Z with another Z. These could be different components, if you like. They're, it doesn't matter which way you multiply them. The complex conjugates, it doesn't matter which way they multiply them. But if you multiply one by its complex conjugate, then you have a non-commutation between them. A times B is not B times A, or Z, Z bar is not Z bar Z. And the way it's not, they don't commute is a very characteristic thing where this is a sort of identity quantity. Anyway, let, let me not go into the details. But then you go back to the formulae I had before, say, OK, now these are quantized things. They're not just classical things. They don't commute anymore. And you go through everything. It's just the same as it was before. 
one little detail is that the helicity, now you have to, you can't write it just as ZZ bar. I, I probably wish to do that so fast you didn't see it last time, but let me bring that up here. Uh, the classical version of the spin here, the helicity, it, I do, yes, it's in that little formula at the bottom here. Uh, twice the helicity is ZZ bar. But these things now, since they don't commute, you're going to be a little careful, and it's ZZ bar plus Z bar Z, which is the most natural thing you can do. Then you find that the com commutation rules that momentum and angular momentum have, and you know from your physics books, come about simply from this. You just take this formula, plug it in the formula and for the M's and P's down here, and out pops the rather complicated looking relationship that physicists will know that these P's and M's have among themselves. So it's rather ha neat, if it's nothing else, at least it's a neat way of describing uh, things of this kind. When you talk about particles with no mass, twister theory is an extremely neat way. In fact, this neatness has become important when people talk about scatterings of particles at very, very high energies, and that's an important thing to do in the LHC, for example, then you can get away with considering that these particles don't have any mass, because most of the energy in this is in their motion rather than their mass. And then you find that twisters are a very, very good way of describing what's going on. And there's a lot that started by something that Ed Whitten did, another one of the Leschitz uh, award winners. And he introduced a combination of twister theory and string theory, which has now um, developed quite considerably in ways that you can um, describe these high energy particle processes. Now, I'm not going to use that here. What I'm going to do is something more basic. I'm going to say, what, is, what does quantum mechanics look like in twister form? What would Schrodinger do with twister formalism? Well, he'd form wave functions. Now, you see, wave functions, that's a quantum description, say, of a particle. That wave function, you could think of it as a function of position. So you have a complex function of position. That's the Schrodinger wave function, it's like that. Or you could say, no, no, let's think of the momentum description. So you think of the momentum of the particle, and then you have a function of momentum. Now these are sort of conjugate descriptions. And because the position of momentum satisfy a conjugate relationship like this one here, where they don't commute in just this kind of way, you can have one or the other, and those are sort of conjugate descriptions. Now here, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to mirror that, but with twisters. So I'm saying that my twister and its complex conjugate are now the conjugate variables, and the twister function will be a function of one in one formalism or a function of the other in the other formalism. You've got to make a choice. You could say, do I like the position representation or would I prefer the momentum representation? Here you say, would I like the Z representation or the Z bar representation? The twister representation or the deal one? You make a choice. Okay, I'll just make the Z just arbitrarily. Now you see, in ordinary quantum mechanics, if you want a wave function, in the position form, say, what is momentum? Well, momentum is not there in the wave function. Momentum now becomes an operator, it's differentiation with respect to position. If you use the momentum one, what's position? Well, it's differentiation with respect to momentum. Funny idea, that's the way quantum mechanics works. So I'll just copy it. What do we do here? You say, if you have a function of z, what does it mean for it to be independent of z bar? What does it mean? Well, you write down this equation, d of f by z, d z bar equals naught. What does that mean? That's what's called the Cauchy-Riemann equations. It means your function is what's called holomorphic. This function is a nice, beautiful, complex function of the kind that fascinated me when I was an undergraduate. Beautiful subject, and this was really attractive. Okay, the wave functions then are functions, holomorphic functions, complex functions in the very nice way that complex functions can be. Now, suppose you're looking at a wave function which describes a particle which has a definite spin to it, a definite helicity. What does that mean? Well, you look at this operator, this S I have, you see what it is, you fiddle around with it, and you see it says that your function, if it's going to have a definite helicity, that function has a definite homogeneity. That means that there's a, if you multiply your twister by some number, then the whole wave function gets multiplied by some power of that number. And that is the homogeneity degree, what that power is. 
So you say, oh God, that's amazing. It's a very neat way of talking about particles with no mass. They are described by holomorphic functions, complex analytic functions, which are homogeneous of a very particular degree, that degree describing exactly the amount of spin that that particle has. You could do it the other way around with your Ws. Okay, now I'm going to show you how that relates to the more conventional way that physicists would do. You've got these functions which are homogeneous and holomorphic. What do you do, what do, you do with them? Well, how would an, uh, an ordinary physicist treat massless particles? Well, when I say an ordinary physicist, it probably has to be Dirac or somebody because he introduced these ideas a long time ago and it was his formalism that I'm really using here, more or less. Now, <clears throat> you can have particles which have different helicities. It can have no helicity, it can be a massless, uh, spinless particle, then it's just uh, described by the wave operator, the wave function, it's just a well-known thing. Or it can have a helicity, it can be left-handed spinning or right-handed spinning, and that's accompanied by a lot of indices here. So these indices, if they're not primed, you see, if you remember the notation I gave you with these two spinners, which are print some of the indices we had primes on them and some didn't, and that was the thing I had here. Um, if they're not primed, the primed ones are little, little uh, index. Little, that's the prime. Either they're primed or they're not primed, and they're complex conscious with each other. If they're not primed, then they have spin left-handed. If they are primed, they spin right-handed, and these things are totally symmetrical in their indices. And then there's a, an equation that they satisfy, which is, I've written down here. And those of you, this is just the differentiation operator. I won't say more details, because that's not what I want to do here. But you have a well-known equation, basically Dirac's, which tells you how these, what the, what the wave function is, how, what the Schrodinger equation does to your, your wave function. And that's basically it. Now, how does that come out about it twisted? I'll just give you examples here. If you look at my formula for the velocity, you see that if it's a scalar particle with no spin, then your homogeneity would be minus two. Suppose it's a Dirac vial, let's call it, a neutrino which has no mass. Well, they probably don't exist, but don't worry. It's an idealization of neutrinos. They have very little mass. Suppose it was zero, then they would be described by this situation. And if it was left spinning, it would have homogeneity, I think that's minus three, and right spinning, it would be, my, uh, left spinning would be minus one, and right spinning would be minus three. What about Maxwell's equations? This is a photon now, we're talking about spin one. Then it's zero homogeneity for left-handed and minus four for right-handed. What about graviton? Well, you can say take Einstein's theory and linearize it, we okay, flatten it all out, approximation to Einstein's theory. Then it's the two homogeneities are, the, the two helicities are minus two or plus two, and the homogeneity is on plus two or minus six. It looks terribly lopsided. And it's lopsided because the formalism is lopsided. I've chosen, I've made a choice, the Zs and not the Z bars. That choice gives a helicity to the description. Left-handed is fundamentally different from right-handed in this description. It doesn't mean the physics is, it just means that the description is picked out left-handed as opposed to right-handed, or whichever way you want to say it. And if you know about Maxwell's equations, you want to know how it relates to these phi's and things I've got over there. There's a straight, straightforward formula. This is the Maxwell field tensor. If you want to know about gravity in the linearized form, this is the straightforward Einstein curvature tensor when you have a vacuum, and this is what's called the vial tensor. Don't let, I don't worry about details. But these things are equations which are conformally invariant, and the not too complicated when you write them this way, but they're still equations. You've got these equations to satisfy. What does twister theory do? Well, twister theory just gives you a function which is homogeneous and holomorphic. Now, here's a bit of magic. What you find is that you put the function in an integral, it's called a contour integral, so you integrate around a loop of some sort, and then the thing that you get over here is the space-time description, here is the twister description. And this satisfies these equations, whichever one you're looking at. I guess I wrote them down over here. In a general case, those are the equations. And 
these equations are automatically satisfied when you do the contra-integral. That really rather appealed to me, uh, that somehow the fact that the function is holomorphic, differentiable, smooth in the complex sense, holomorphic, and of a particular homogeneity degree, the other way of putting that is it's defined on the projective space in a certain way. And that's not much information. It's easy. You can easily write down zillions of things like that without thinking. And every one of them gives you a solution of these equations, the Maxwell equations or the linear Einstein equations. Now there's a catch. And this was something that when I first thought about this, this is very strange. Because in order for this contra-integral to work, and in this example I've given, there are two denominator things here, where the thing's got singularities, and those are represented by planes, these are just linear things on the bottom. So there are two planes where the thing goes singular, and you've got to do a contra-integral which goes around these things. That's a bit difficult to see here, it's perhaps easier in this picture, no, it's easier here. So you remember a line in this twisted space is really a Riemann sphere, the singularities are here and here, there and there, the contra-integral separates the singularities, and that is what you need to get the solution of the Maxwell equations. You could smear, add lots of these together and smear them around and make huge singularity area, areas. And you've got a thing in twisted space which has got two, well, two camel, camel humps. And these singularities are the camel humps. And the place where this thing is non-singular is in the top half of twisted space. I don't think I should really bother you with why that is important. But this gives you a wave function of positive frequency. You see, I said earlier, you want to have a space which is divided in two by the things you can see directly, the, the PN space, divided in two, and one side is positive frequency and the other side is negative frequency. Well, you can see that directly in this picture. So you get that condition straight away. Now, what about these awkward camel humps? Now, I thought, this is stupid. Why? You have to have singularities pointing in the region you want. And certainly when you add loads of them up, these, these singularities will be all over the place, and you won't have any room to do any contra intervals. I found this extremely puzzling. Okay, well, I'll to cut the story a little short and say the answer came through discussions with Michael Atia in Oxford. I had recently moved to Oxford, and one of the great attractions of being in Oxford was that another one of our uh, winners, the second one uh, of the left shirt winners, Michael Atiyah, who I used to know as a graduate student, and uh, he had a great influence on me, and I learned all about this subject, which I'd heard about before, but I didn't really understand it, and he explained it not just to me, but to the graduate students and so on. How do you understand the camel humps? Basically, this is the way you think about it. So I'm interested in the top half of twister space, PC plus, that's where the wave functions are sitting in a sense, and I've got this great intrusion, two of them, separated from each other, where the singularities are. And you need them because you want to counter-integrate round them to get any answer at all. And they, anyway, they have to be there for negative homogeneity. Here's what you do. You say, okay, think of the region where the function is defined. That's the intersection of two regions, but one of the camel humps is removed, and the other, where the other camel hump is removed. Now they're both removed in the intersection. And what, the, what you're trying to talk about is the union of the two. In other words, the union of those two regions, and that's whole of PT plus. And what you really are doing, the twister function, the thing I've been talking about, the holomorphic functions and all that, are lying on this intersection. So, more generally, you would have lots and lots of patches. This is where you have two, the covering of the top half of twister space by two open sets. The cover is the whole of the top half. The intersections of the different sets are where the twister functions sit. Here I've just got two functions. You might have many of them, and you've got your twister functions on the intersections, and so on. Beautiful. And it's not just beautiful. It's something well known to the right people. And it's very important in the theory of complex manifolds. But what you get is what's called uh, sheaf cohomology. Now, you see, I didn't know what that was until Michael explained it to me very beautifully. And this is a representative. You see, you don't want really these camel humps. They're just one way of getting at the 
object that is hiding behind it all, this cohomology thing. Now, I was once interviewed by a television crew about Twisters, strangely enough, I don't quite know why, but they seemed to be wanting to know about Twisters, and we had these Twisters run. Robinson conferences all over the place and things like that. And then I said, well, they said, what's it useful for? So one of the things it's useful for is solving Maxwell's equations. But I don't think I can explain that. Oh, yes, what's that? No, well, it's some idea called cohomology, and that's certainly I'm not going to explain. It just wouldn't be any point in the popular exposition to explain what cohomology is. So I went home, and I started thinking, oh, my God, I can think of a way of explaining cohomology. And they say I showed them this, and they weren't interested. But let me show it to you. How do you understand what cohomology is when you don't know anything about it? Think about this picture. Now this is an impossible picture. It represents something that you couldn't make. It's made up, if you like, of three rods stuck together in a way which is inconsistent. However, let me try and do it. And the way I would do this is to take my triangle and split it into pieces, each of which I could easily make out of wood. And you've got pictures of those three pieces, and then you've got a manual of how to construct your triangle, and this manual tells you how to glue that one to that, tells you how to glue that one to that, and it tells you how to glue that to that. And then you look at these instructions and say, whoops, the manual has told me to make this impossible object. That's no good. But well, it's no good if you want to make a triangle, but it's very good if you want to describe cohomology. The cohomology is the obstruction to making that. This particular type of cohomology, it's called check cohomology, is a way of telling you what's wrong with this picture, if you like. If the cohomology element that you construct, what you do is you say, okay, I've got a function here, so you have to match these, and to match these, and match these. And you do just the thing which I flip through without really explaining it over here. You've got these functions on the overlaps, and they satisfy certain properties, and then you factor out by uh, certain things and abstract from that the notion of cohomology. And that thing you abstract from that is exactly, in this case of this triangle, the thing that tells you if it's not zero, it's an impossible object. If it is zero, okay, you could go and build it. So this is cohomology for the people who don't know what cohomology is. Um, I didn't know about this when Michael Tia told me what cohomology was. It was only much later that I realized this is this impossibility encodes a notion which is exactly the notion that we want to describe these things, what these things are. You see, the thing that li lies in the top half of Twister space, and I didn't show you this, but it's all tied up with the fact that the top half is all to do with, with um, and complex vectors lying, no less, forget about that. <laughs> it's to do with the top half of twisted space, which gives you your proper wave functions. And these wave functions are cohomology elements. They're not functions in the sense that Fro Schrodinger would have understood. They are these strange things which express the incompatibility of trying to extend your function over the whole space. And that is this cohomology element. It's a non-local thing, which I thought was a wonderful thing to have, because you need to have non-locality. You see, it was one of the early motivations that certainly didn't get rec realized for a long time. I, I certainly, it was an important part of the development of this theory. You want a way of describing space-time that is basically not local. And here you start to see where some non-locality, which comes about, and why do you want non-locality? Well, because of effects that we know are present in quantum mechanics, where you get things called entanglements, something over there and something over there, somehow know, know about each other in a very subtle way that this information can't send, its, send itself over there. It's some mysterious entanglement between those two things, and that entanglement is a non-local thing, and it seems to me very likely that the twisted description of space-time will get us a handle on that very non-locality that we do see in quantum systems when they are widely separated. Okay, uh, just as a hint of what I want to say tomorrow, um, 
this extends to something which you see this is linear you're talking about equations where the solutions you can add them up and you still have a solution if you want to talk about space-time and you want to talk about Einstein's theory of general relativity you're talking about curved spaces now, curved spaces are things which um, are very hard to incorporate into twister theory um, and you need to generalize the framework which I've been giving you you can see how to generalize it in a certain way and this I'll say about tomorrow but the basic idea is you don't just have patches of functions painted on your space you think of these functions as actually sticking bits of space together so you have what's called an atlas of different patches and you have a way of gluing them together it's very much like this picture I have of an impossible triangle you get something which is globally a piece of information locally it doesn't mean anything and you get something which is in a sense a twisted space which is curved in a certain way and that curvature had been in a form which you could do Einstein's equations with all its non-linearities the only catch, and this is the big catch is it only worked for left-handed gravitons if you like left-handed solutions of the Einstein equations and it had been a big puzzle how on earth you have a formalism which does left and right at the same time remember you had to make a choice a chirality choice I said do you choose the twisters or the dual twisters if you choose the twisters then it's one way the dual twisters is the other way you want to have a formalism which brings them both together and which doesn't throw away all the nice things that you get from twister theory and enables you to build a curved space now the ideas of how to do this only came about, I think, the right way in some years uh, ago, when I say about three years ago, partly largely from discussions with Michael Atiyah and then other people later on, and now I've had lots of discussions with Ernesto, and I really think we might be able to make some progress on this to understand what curved space-time geometries look like in a genuine twisted formalism. Let me leave it at that. Thank you very much. for this delightful lecture, Dr. Penrose. Now, we're going to have a questions and answer session. So, I do have a question for Dr. Penrose. Please raise your hand and uh, one member of our staff is going to give you a microphone. So if I understood it well, uh, today was the easy lecture, and tomorrow is the hard one. <laughs> this was the easy one, ah, okay. yes. <laughs> uh, a question that I had actually also yesterday. Why the photon is so important and the graviton uh, seems to take a second uh, seat? Well, me, uh, okay. Because uh, you, you, you mentioned it briefly, uh, only as you know, linear approximation, etc. But uh, you have also worked on the nonlinear graviton. I kind of expected him to play more of a role. Yeah, yeah. No, you're quite right. I only said photon because that's the most familiar particle, which is massless. It's also easier to handle because the, cur the space does not curve. However, and I agree with you here, that it's really the graviton that has to be the key. You want to have a, a way in which you describe the space-time curvature in accordance with Einstein's general theory of relativity. And it's not just linear equations, you have non-linear equations and it's more difficult. You see, I tend to think that the fact that it's more difficult is good because, you see, the photons are away, in a way too easy. You get misled because you can do things with, with things that don't itself interact, uh, which you don't see the, what the problems are. But with the graviton, it self interacts, and it's nonlinear, and it's not just cohomology. It's the way in which cohomology, you might say you exponentiate the cohomology. You can think, this is like a description I'd like to have. 
The cohomology describes things going on. You've got a covering of your space with patches, and they're glued together, and you've got some paint on the individual patches. And then you wait overnight, and the paint dries, and it crinkles up the patches. And that crinkling up is a curved space now. And that's exactly what you do in this case. Now, it's been a stumbling block for, I've lost track of how many years, over 40, but about half, of, about half a century, that we've been able to see how to do, well, take your choice, but the left-handed nonlinear graviton, but it doesn't do the right-handed. So you need a formalism which extends the one we've had to do, and curiously, which we heard today, which curiously uses ingredients which I told you about just now. It uses those ingredients unchanged, but in a way which I hadn't foreseen. And I think it leads you to important new insights where it's non the geometry, something that the subject I've been frightened of for a long time and I've started to learn a bit more about it. And I really think that is the route to go. I'm not talking about quantum gravity yet. This is classical general relativity, curved spaces. How does twisted space work in such curved spaces? Can you describe them? Yes, yeah, yeah. so you see, the trouble here is it's all perturbative. The thing which is attractive, attracting me here, is you get solutions, not just maximum equations, but the nonlinear Yan Mills equations there. You don't have a per 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 perturbative way of getting Yan. It actually gives you the solution. Now here you want something which does the same thing, but which is not left-handed or right-handed. Now I understand and I appreciate the importance of looking at per perturbative techniques and also the importance of, of techniques which have been developed in, in, in conjunction with string theory methods, and I agree with that, as, as Witten showed us how to do, and which do enable you to get in the surprising directions and to do things even which talk about gravitons. But you still are looking at perturbative technique which doesn't curve the space. You have to do something which is non-perturbative if that space is going to be genuinely curved. And that's what I claim we seem to be able maybe to do. There's still a maybe attached to it, but I think maybe we can. Um, I have a question over here, and I've got the microphone. Sir Penrose over here, all the way to the back. That jumping, way. jumping. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see, it, yes. Uh, well, uh, I think that from, from all of us, we thank you from Sherry for sharing part a little bit of your knowledge. And I have a probably a naive question. At which, po at which point co-homology could relate to the inflationary state of the universe? When you see, oh, sorry, what, should I be answering that? that oh, I'm sorry, where are you? <laughs> over here, over here, standing. Over there. The, All the way to the back, the moving place. around. Over there. Yes, I see you. Um, the stationary state of you, but it's not necessarily stationary, if that's what you said. I mean, you see, it's not directly cohomology if you're going to talk about space-time, which are curved. And if you're talking about cosmology, you definitely have space-times which are curved. If you're talking about general relativity in any serious way, the space-times are curved. So you have to have a way which describes the curved space. And I think in relation to the question just earlier, yeah, cohomology gets you a long way, if you like, but it doesn't curve the space. It just gives you an infinitesimal curvature, if you like, and that infinitesimal curvature doesn't do things that are interesting to me, anyway. You certainly don't get black holes that way. You just have a way to start, if you like. It's pointing you how to move, maybe. It doesn't do the movement. So what I'm saying, you must have a way of describing a genuinely curved space in the twister formula. And I think that the way to do that is what I'm going to talk about to, to people tomorrow. So it's not just cohomology, you have to go beyond cohomology. And you, even, even for the uh, left-handed, the, the gravitons which are spinning in one way or the other, uh, you need to go beyond cohomology. So it's not just cohomology, the cohomology is the sort of infinitesimal version of it. If you want to go a finite direction that way, that finite direction is 
sense, exponentiating the cohomology or going beyond the cohomology. It's genuinely patching curved spaces up. And what we appear to mean is a way which does it left-handed and right-handed, all in the same formula. Yes. Uh, uh, we're running out of time, so we have time only for two, two short questions. Please. The short answer is this. <laughs> Where are the questions? I wonder if there is something like a crystal calculus to handle integral functions. Crystal calculus, calculus, in the sense that integration, how to handle the function integration in crystal theory? Oh, yeah, well, that features very strongly. I mean, you can't get very far without integrating. You see, I gave you examples of proper integrals. But when you look about scattering processes, you have integrals over many, many dimensions. And the, the theories that people have been working on, originally uh, my colleagues in Oxford, and Andrew Hodges in particular, but nowadays lots of people are looking at twister integrals in higher dimensions. When I say higher dimensions, it's lots and lots of twister spaces all together. And you have integrations on the spaces. So yes, it features very strongly. Uh, I, I would like to ask the following question. Are you not tempted to consider linear gravitons so that the, for instance, Weyl tensor would be uh, represented as uh, a non-linear approximation due to graviton-graviton interaction? Yes. Well, I mean, that's, yeah, sure. But in a way that's related to my response to earlier questions that that's looking at the perturbative way of doing it. And what I'm, I'm sure, that in a sense, that's what people do. When they're looking now at twister strings and the ideas where people have been developing, I mentioned Witten, but uh, my colleagues in Oxford and Lionel Mason and, and uh, Andrew Hodges, and most particularly but lots of other people, and uh, uh, Nina Kani Ahmed, who's in Princeton, has been developing the ideas a lot. So there are a lot of things which do develop in this sort of perturbative way. And yes, you do look at graviton-graviton interactions, which is fine. I'm nothing against it. It's just that it seems to me twisted theory should be doing more than that. You should be actually looking at the curved space itself and not just some kind of kernel, some infinitesimal um, thing that you've got to some infinite numbers of Feynman diagrams or something to, to obtain. I mean, there are problems I have with causality. You see, as long as you're just doing infinitesimal stuff, you never, sp you never bend the space. The causality is still flat space causality. If you want to describe a black hole, you've got to have something where the causality has got seriously affected. And you're not going to see that unless you have a genuinely curved space. So, I, okay, I can understand arguments from both sides, but this is my point of view. Well, I remember some very old lecture of Feynman yeah. who was considering linear gravity theory sure. and suddenly he was constructing energy momentum tensor and suddenly <laughs> he assumed that this linear gravity now interacts with its own sure. energy, etc., etc. Well, he was doing per very much perturbative approach. I mean, I'm not sure how well that actually works. I mean, it was a nice idea. And people have certainly followed that route often. But you, uh, I mean, in those days, people didn't think much about black holes. They probably didn't know about them. <laughs> Whereas if you want something which is genuinely different from the flat space situation, and not in a way which you could imagine getting easily by a power series. I mean, these things, maybe could you, sure. I mean, if you want to describe curved space situations in practice, people will often resort to power series types of expansions and so on. Even you want to know how planets move around the sun with uh, gravitational, you know, Einstein corrections to things. There's nothing wrong with that in the right situations. But to me, it's not probing deeply enough in the way which I feel twister theory should do. And that goes straight to the curved space <laughs> rather than just looking at a perturbative a way of approaching the curved space. Well, before proceeding to the last question, I would <laughs> like to mention that Dr. Penrose is going to give a talk tomorrow, so you can approach him. I think he's going to 
have uh, not a busy schedule than today. So please, last question. Okay, I have a little question for you about the Robinson Congruence yeah. in your graphics before. Um, and the um, ellipses, ellipses that are drawn there, uh, yeah. corresponds to spinor ome omega? Oh. Yes, mm -hmm. if you have the pi mm -hmm. and the omega. Omega. So the pi the is the linear momentum of the yes. of some mm -hmm. photon. Then the the symmetrical axis is the, the direction, direction of the that direction it moves. Of That's that the photon? Yeah. That's okay. the direction it moves. See the arrow I had. Um, see if I can find my picture. Here we are. Yeah. See there was a an arrow at the top, which is the direction that the photon and that and again in response to the other question, it's not really necessarily a photon. Any massless particle, including a graviton, if you're looking at the linear limit of gravitons, okay. you will have this picture. Uh, it's not specific to photons. Okay. But here is the direction it moves. So that arrow tells you how it moves. And this whole configuration moves through the speed of light along that arrow. But that's just geometry. You don't have to know anything about where it came from. This is, it's probably a little complicated to do directly. But this configuration, if you know what it is, you will see that each one of these points moves along where the arrow points in a straight line with the speed of light. And this automatically reconstructs this configuration further along. So this configuration tells you everything. If you want to know what does this configuration do as time evolves, it moves along the direction of that arrow. But that's already inbuilt into the picture. I'm not sure I answered your question, but... Yes, thank you. Then this, this diagram is in the space-time, in the... In the space time, not in the spa in the twister space. The Robinson Congress is in the space time. Oh yeah, this is in the space time. Okay. You see, thank I'm you. only taking <laughs> one moment. That was my question. A moment of time. You see. Okay. Thank you, you very one, much. T equals zero. That's your picture. Okay. T equals one. That's your picture. Thank you. So it moves understand. along, and that is a four-dimensional picture. Each point in this picture follows the line where the arrow is. That would be a light ray. Those are the light rays which are orthogonal in the twister sense to the complex uh, twister, which is off the real slice. Okay. If you want to see, if you want to make this curved space, you're going to see how to generalize this configuration so that it still makes sense when you've got conformal curvature. And that's what the question which I shall attempt to address tomorrow. I wasn't expecting to say it this way, but that <laughs> seems to be uh, an interesting way to address the question. Thank, Thank you very much.